Congratulations. You have all chosen to be born at the best time ever in human history, and also the most important and most interesting time. It might seem a bit odd to say that this, this is the best time in human history, with the poisonous stuff happening in the Middle East and seeping out into the rest of the world, with a lot of people telling us that the world is overheating, and with a global economy which is sluggish at best. But this chart explains why it is the best time in history to be born. The beginning of the chart is 1820, and at that point, and for the entire history of the human species before then, over 90% of us lived in extreme poverty. And in the next 200 years, something really remarkable happened. That number went down below 10%, and that's a worldwide number. In Europe and in the States, it's a lot lower than that. And whatever metric you care to use, female education, child mortality, longevity, health, we are in a much better place now than we've ever been before. And there's two simple reasons for that. The first one is the market economy with regulations and governance. And the second one, which is what we're going to be focusing on, is technology. And the interesting thing is that we're really only at the beginning. Although technology has already produced this remarkable change, there's a lot more coming. And our most powerful technology is artificial intelligence. If you have a smartphone, it's stuffed full of artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence has already delivered something quite close to omniscience in the form of Google search and Wikipedia and so on. And our ancestors would have thought that was actually much more impressive than hoverboards or flying cars. And artificial intelligence is progressing very fast. These six tech giants are essentially AI companies. And they're very big and they're very rich. Apple is the biggest company in the world. Google spends so much on R&D that its R&D spend in dollars is the same as the UK's R&D spend in pounds. That's government, businesses, everything. There are three things driving AI forwards. If AI is like a car, then algorithms are the driver. Big data is the fuel. And the thing that underpins it all, the engine, is computer processing power. Now, computer processing power is getting more, computers are getting more powerful twice as powerful every 18 months. This is a process known as Moore's Law. Many of you will probably have heard of it. And this is what Moore's Law looks like. It's exponential growth. When you have exponential growth, it's very fast, and it suddenly shoots up. So we are always at the knee in this chart, always. The past always looks a bit dull, and the future always looks very exciting, or scary, depending on how you look at it. It's very important to understand an exponential growth if you're going to understand what's happening in our future. If you take 30 steps at normal pace, you'll travel about 30 meters. If you could take 30 exponential steps, then you'd go to the moon. In fact, that's not quite right. The 29th step would take you to the moon. The 30th step would bring you all the way back, which illustrates two things. Firstly, the power of exponential growth and also the fact that it's backloaded. Another great example of it is Imagine you're in Wembley Stadium and it's been made waterproof. And the referee drops a single drop of water in the middle of the pitch. And a minute later, she drops two drops of water there. And a minute after that, four drops. And a minute after that, eight drops. How long do you think it would take to fill the stadium? The answer, incredibly, is 49 minutes. But the really scary thing is that after 45 minutes, the, the pitch is only 7% full. So the people at the back are looking down and thinking, it's getting a bit damp down there. Maybe we should leave. And four minutes later, they've drowned. So exponential growth is very fast. And in the next few years, it's going to bring us some really remarkable things. Firstly, digital assistance. Now, Siri at the moment is a bit of a joke. But in five or 10 years, you're going to talk with Siri. You're going to have conversations with Siri. And, and he, she, or it is going to be fantastically helpful. And combined with the Internet of Things, which is the placing of sensors and chips throughout the, the world, <coughs> It's going to make the environment intelligible. We're going to get self-driving cars. You're going to start to see those appearing. And when they replace human-driven cars, <clears throat> that will save about 1.2 million deaths a year on the roads, because at the moment, we're sending humans to do a machine's job. Next year, Oculus Rift launches. And that's the beginning of a new age of virtual reality. And that's going to change a lot. That's going to change a lot about the way we tell stories and about the way we communicate. And we're going to get personalized medicine. 
And that's going to help us all live longer and live healthier lives. But looking further ahead, still in your lifetimes, we're going to get two revolutions which are so powerful that they deserve the term singularity. And singularity is a term coming in uh, from maths and physics where change gets so dramatic that the previous rules just break down. They don't work anymore. The classic example is a black hole from physics. If you get to the event horizon of a black hole, if you're unfortunate enough for that to happen to you, you will find that the normal rules of physics stop working. So there are two singularities coming. The first one is the economic singularity, and the second is the technological singularity. <clears throat> I'll talk about each in turn. The economic singularity is what happens if and when we get technological unemployment, so that machines do all the jobs that humans do. And, of course, the great thing about machines is that they don't sleep, they don't get tired, they don't get cranky, they're not irrational, they don't need a pay rise. So as soon as a machine can do your job, I'm afraid it will. Now, economists, mainstream economists, will say this is rubbish. It's the Luddite fallacy. We've had automation since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, and it didn't destroy long-term long employment. It actually raised the level of, econ of economic activity and created more wealth, created more demand, and created more jobs. However, this time, it's different. Not everybody agrees with this, but I certainly think this time it's different, because in previous rounds of automation, the machines were replacing our muscle power. In this coming round of automation, they're replacing our cognitive abilities, and they're getting better and better. AI, I should say, isn't just one thing in a black box. It's a whole series of different techniques and, <coughs> and, and skills and abilities. And the ability of computers to recognize and classify image, the ability to uh, recognize uh, speech, and the ability to, to do natural language processing is advancing dramatically quickly and they are going to replace all the jobs that we do, or most of the jobs that we do. Now, both of the singularities can have very good outcomes or very bad outcomes. The very good outcome of the economic singularity is that the robots do all the work and we don't have to. Who wouldn't want to live in a world where robots and AIs, robots are really peripherals of AIs, pamper us and we just live lives of leisure. We play, we learn, we play sport. Of course, there is a negative potential outcome, uh, which is that a small number of people, and they're called Larry Page and Mark Zuckerberg, own all the AI, and because AI adds all the value, they own everything else as well. And the rest of us live off their generosity. And you could get a dystopian outcome where we are all classified and herded and controlled in a rather unpleasant way. Aldous Huxley's Brave New World is a, an example. The second singularity is the technological singularity. Now, the, nobody knows for sure whether these things are going to happen, but they do look very likely. The economic singularity, nobody knows for sure when it'll happen, but probably 20 to 30 years. The technological singularity, again, nobody knows when, but maybe 40 to 70 years, maybe. And it's when we create an artificial general intelligence. AI at the moment is all very narrow intelligence. Deep Blue can play chess better than you can, but it can't tie its shoelaces. It couldn't get itself in here, and it wouldn't know it's playing chess. An artificial general intelligence has all the cognitive abilities that we do, and it might be conscious. It might not, but it probably would. But importantly, once you get to that point, you can then enhance its performance, and it becomes a super intelligence, smarter than us. And not just a bit smarter. It's entirely likely that when we get to AGI, we quite quickly arrive at a superintelligence which is a thousand or a million times smarter than us. Now, the upside of that is, wow, we've got a sort of big brother, big sister who can solve all our problems. There's a leading AI researcher who likes to say that the future plan for humanity is a two-step plan. Step one, solve intelligence. Step two, use that to solve everything else. And by everything else, he means everything else. Poverty, age, Syria, death. So here's an interesting thought. If all this happens, you may be the first generation of humans that don't have to die. I'll pause slightly to let that sink in. <laughs> and as with the economic singularity, there's a potential downside. It's usually shown as this gentleman here, he's been doing this job for 34 years, must be a bit tired. Um, <laughs> and actually a better analogy is, is the sorcerer's apprentice. The machine has a goal, and it doesn't love us and it doesn't hate us, but the goal is actually rather bad for us. For instance, it decides that gravity is the wrong number on this Earth, and it decides to change the, the gravitational number, 
and we all suddenly sink into the ground. There's lots of ways that, that this could go rather badly wrong. We cannot stop the progress of AI because we're worried about the fact it might have negative consequences. The advantage to any company, government, or army of having a better AI is overwhelming. Whatever can be done with AI will be done, and as soon as it can be done. The good news is, there's a lot of us, and we're a rather clever little mammal. We have to make sure that we get the good outcomes and not the bad outcomes of the two singularities. So, the challenge, the mission for your generation, should you choose to accept it, is to make sure that we get the good outcome from the economic singularity and the technological singularity and not the bad one. So my answer <coughs> to the question we were asked, will, intelligent in, will artificial intelligence enhance or diminish our humanity, is it's up to you. Thank you. <laughs>